The views expressed on this broadcast of the Take 12 Recovery Radio Show do not necessarily reflect those of KHLT Recovery Broadcasting or its affiliates. KHLT and Take12Radio.com are not affiliated with any particular 12-step fellowship. Welcome to Walking Through the Big Book with Chris Schroeder and Monty Meyer. And now, here's those two guys who investigate prior to contempt, Chris and the Monty Man. Yes, my friends, here's those two guys, those two wild and crazy individuals, and we are doing our best to walk through the big book. Chris Schroeder and I are here for you, doing the best that we can, hopefully bringing to you uh, some insight, maybe for the very first time, into the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Hey, Chris. Monty, how are you doing today? Uh, I am doing superior today. And that doesn't mean that I'm superior, but uh, the the day is just, you know, I, I was sitting in here, I was telling uh, uh, Pastor Mitch the other day, I was sitting here in here in the audio booth and just kind of being quiet, maybe, you know, meditating a little bit. And I looked over at at the uh, the the sound, uh, the sound foam that we have on the walls and the ceiling. And then I looked over at the doorknob. Okay, these are very simple things. And I looked over at the, uh, the the two chairs we have for guests, and I was suddenly just flooded with gratitude, you know. And I, and I was thinking about the end of my trail, the end the end of my journey of using and drinking, and where God has brought me thus far. And I tell you, I felt uh, I was I was humbled, and I just felt so grateful. It was like somebody had just put a sheet. Of uh, of some sort of gratitude charge over me, and I got kind of teary eyed, and I just found myself really grateful. I, is, has that ever happened to you? Just sometimes out of the blue? Oh, sure, all the way through my uh, my recovery journey. Yeah, I'll be driving, and, and all of a sudden, I'll just I'll have a sense of peace and comfort and and gratitude come over me. And I, I I call those God hugs, and and I think I think what's happening is I think. Uh, we get encouraged in uh, in spiritual and intuitive ways uh, to keep going the way we're going. And yeah, it, you know it's it's encouragement. Uh, it's encouragement for me uh, to let me know that uh, the, the things that the things that are going on in my life are infinitely better than mm. uh, they could have they could be. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, considering uh, our sordid past. Yeah, I like the word "God hugs" better than "God shots." That, that's that that uh, God shots make me think of God sitting yeah. up there with a with with a shot glass. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, God hugs. That's really great. Yeah, it's a good it's a good life to be living in it. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, every day there's uh, there's new things, new new wonderful things uh, coming across the horizon. So what's going on this week? Well, you know, we're we're about to go from uh, the preparation for the work into the work. Mm-hmm. We're about to embark upon uh, probably a three week journey through the chapter working with others. And at this point in time, we've had a spiritual awakening. At this point in time, we're we can intuitively know how to handle situations or newcomers, <laughs> you know, that used to baffle us. At, at this at this point in time, we're, we've um, We've, we've, I wouldn't say finished our preparation because that's a lifetime job, but we're now ready uh, to to go out and seek out uh, people that we can uh, they, that we can help and we can bring them into uh, the fellowship we crave and we mm-hmm. we can uh, we can help them escape the alcoholic uh, uh, alcoholic trap that you know so many of us in, were in for so long. Right. And you know one of the things uh, one of the things that I 
I kind of hinted at in, in some earlier shows is, if you don't mind, Monty, whenever there's a statement that, uh, of uh, what we're supposed to do, an instruction, mm-hmm. a direction, would you mark, would you, would you number that uh, as we're going through the book? Because I've never done this, but I have a feeling that it, there's going to be a staggering amount of instruction in this chapter as far as what we're supposed to do, the, the directions we're supposed to take. Okay. And, again, one of the things that I think is, is so, so lacking in any of the 12-step fellowships is adherence to and even understanding of uh, what this chapter is telling us to do. Mm-hmm. I think, I think if, uh, if everyone that got into a 12-step fellowship followed Chapter 7 and made it part of their, their operational methodology, I think we could, we could almost wipe out uh, um, a, a addiction for the people who want help. Mm. And right now there are so many people who really do want help, but they're so, you know, they're, they're so confused and caught up in so many different things and ways and directions and, and processes uh, that it's, it's sometimes it's kind of difficult to find yeah. the right uh, path out of uh, that, uh, that addictive illness. Okay, we got, we got our, uh, our special blue pen here to mark where there is direction, and there we go. Okay, we're off. Okay, let's, uh, let's get started then on, uh, on Chapter 7. Practical experience shows that nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics. It works when other activities fail. This is our 12th suggestion. Carry this message to other alcoholics. You can help when no one else can. You can secure their confidence when others fail. Remember, they are very ill. Now, this is a, this is a great paragraph. I mean, imagine, uh, imagine any, other, uh, 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 any other illness that, that is... That is uh, going to end up a uh, progressively fatal illness that's going to end up killing you. Imagine reading something at a doctor's office that says, uh, our, our experience shows that you will be immune from this particular uh, disease or illness if you do this. Mm-hmm. You know? I mean, mm-hmm. uh, there's not a lot of people out there that would, uh, that would balk at doing whatever the pamphlet said for you to do yeah. if, if it meant their survival, if it meant them escaping a progressively fatal illness. Yet so many people um, who, who are um, struggling their way sober and trying to figure out what to do with their lives miss this. They, they miss this, uh, this 12th suggestion. Mm-hmm. Um, it works when other activities fail. I think that there's there's uh, high points and there's low points in someone's sobriety. I know there are times that we're where we're all in the barrel. I know there are times when we're having relationship difficulties, employment difficulties, uh, economic difficulties. This is a this is a tough uh, a tough couple of years that that we've all experienced with the financial meltdown. And a lot of times, what happens is the real negative emotions. That we uh, that we are sometimes susceptible to throw us back into the arms of alcohol, and you know if if we don't have uh, if we don't have something that we can do, an action that we can take, sometimes those negative emotions just pile up on a, on us, you know, become astonishingly difficult <laughs> uh, to to solve, mm-hmm. and we end up uh, we end up with the obsession of the mind, we end up back. Uh, back drinking, sure. And I, I have seen this work for myself, and I've seen it work for countless other people. If you're involved in actively carrying the message, whether it's to an institution, uh, whether it's to to support groups, you know, uh, whether whether no matter where it is, if you're really active doing that, I I don't see those people drinking as long as they're consistent with that activity. Mm, yeah. And then it says you can help where when no one else can. I had an experience uh, one time at a treatment center, and most of the counselors were alcoholic. But this one counselor, I'll never forget her. She came in and she sat down and she was doing group, you know, group where you all sit around in a circle and you complain about what's going on in your head. Right. And uh, and she identified herself in a very strange way. Remember, I haven't, I wasn't exposed to any recovery. Uh, uh, 
of uh, banter at that point in time. I, and she, identif- she identifies herself as, I'm so-and-so. Uh, I'm an adult child of an alcoholic. And then she goes on to start group. And I'm thinking, that's pretty bizarre. Uh-huh. You know, uh, I'm, I'm an adult alcoholic of a librarian. You know, but I don't start, <laughs> I don't start every sentence that way, you know. What is, what is she talking about? And and this woman uh, would would look at me and hit me with this all the time. She would go, "Well, Chris, tell me, are you happy, mad, sad, or glad?" <laughs> and you know, Monty, I was like a week off of twenty years of drinking. Yeah, the, I, I couldn't pick my emotions out. It, my emotions were. It was like if I had every negative emotion and I threw it in a blender and I turned it on ten. You uh-huh. know, I mean, there was there was no differentiation. I didn't know what I was feeling. Sure, it was completely out of my mind. And and she would she would call me on the carpet this way, and I had a real disconnect from her. Uh, I she could not get through to me. And I'm not saying that non-alcoholics can't get through to alcoholics, but this particular one didn't. Uh I sensed no identification from her. I had some identification with some of the alcoholic counselors, and they're the ones that really were able to help me. Ones who I knew they had experienced some of the things I experienced, and their lives were better now. I I just could, you know, they could help when no one else when, could. Yeah, that's right. And uh, uh, I also like where it says here, they are very ill. Yeah. There's a real controversy today about alcoholism being a disease. It, You know, the American Medical uh, Association uh, said it was a disease in the mid-50s, and, you know, they would know better than I do. But, there, but there's still a lot of controversy about it. What this book tells us is, is that we have an illness, that we're very ill. And I seem to like that a little bit more than uh, a, a disease. Certainly, I'm ill. I'm ill mentally. I'm ill spiritually. Uh-huh. I'm, I'm, I'm ill f- physically. There's no doubt about that. So I, I like I like the way he uses uh, uses the word ill. In fact, I don't think disease is used, is it? Uh, not in the book. No. Yeah. Uh, it says that we've had we have diseased minds. Right. You know, uh, which is a lot. Of- <laughs> But um, but I don't th- I don't think they refer to alcoholism as the, a disease. That was that was later, uh, uh, and it's it's acceptable terminology I think uh, I think today. Yeah. But again, it, it brings about uh, a sense of controversy with it that I I kind of like to avoid. Here's here and promises are, are, are spread throughout this chapter, and if I remember, I'll I'll, I'll try to uh, I'll try to point them out. But but here is some: life will take on new meaning. To watch people recover, to see them help others, to watch loneliness vanish, to see a fellowship grow up about you, to have a host of friends. This is an experience you must not miss. We know you will not want to miss it. Frequent contact with newcomers and with each other is the bright spot of our lives. Now, that's kind of the difference between uh, recovered and sober, I think. (laughs) Frequent contact with newcomers was not really the highlight of my life when I was sober. <laughs> and, you know, and it was, certainly wasn't the, the, the bright spot of my life, hearing some knucklehead with, with a week out of detox telling me, you know, what he thought. Uh, but I'll tell you, you know, today, uh, today it, it really is uh, a high point in my life because I'm not coming there to get. Uh, I'm going there to give if that makes any sense. Sure. And, and if there's more people to give to, then, you know, that, that, is a, that is a bright thing. Yeah. Perhaps you are not... A, now, here's where it starts telling us, where are we going to find these alcoholics? Remember, there were only two meetings, uh, two groups of alcoholics that were meeting together when, the, when this book was written. There was, you know, little things were starting up, but, the, but there were main, two main groups, Akron and, and New York. Um, they expected this book to be mailed out and people to find mail order recovery uh, from this book. That's what, the, that's what it was written for, and that's what they expected. It turned out a little different. It turned out that the message was better passed one alcoholic to the other than by mail. How, however, you know, there have been a lot of recoveries based just on exposure to this book. Um, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of groups, you know, have sprung up in different areas uh, because, of, uh, because they got access to this book and just did what it said and then built the fellowship up uh, around them. But this is going to give us some instructions for uh, where we're going to find these alcoholics to carry this message to. And again, this message is 
I've taken the first 11 steps. I've had a spiritual awakening. I'm recovered from alcohol. You know, uh, would you like to do that? You know, that, mm-hmm. that really is the message. Uh, strange as it may sound, Alcoholics Anonymous World Service, if you were to write to New York right now and ask them, what is the message? The answer that they will give you is, whatever you want it to be in your group. All right? That's a very, very unfortunate position. Uh, that they're taking, because if you've been to some of the groups I've been to, Monty, mm-hmm. you know, that's pre- that's a pretty scary perspective. Uh, in yeah. Some of the earlier literature on some of the earlier dust jackets, uh, and, and, et cetera, it basically said the message of Alcoholics Anonymous is in this textbook. It's mm-hmm. the 12 steps. Mm-hmm. And I, I tend to, to still believe that. But that's that's what you're supposed to do. Uh, when you're carrying uh, the, the message, uh, the message uh, is to carry the message of the spiritual awakening, because that's that really is the treatment for alcoholism. Why do you think? Why do you think they would give that answer? Do you think uh, it's to tickle itching ears? Well, it's probably a combination of of a lot of the people in the main office not ever having a real experience with the twelve steps. Ah. Uh, you know, if you went through there and you 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 know you questioned a bunch of them, you know, tell me about your amends. Uh, have you completed your amends? Uh, give me a little bit on your prayer and meditation. You're you're probably not going to get the answer that you would hope for. Mm-hmm. Um, I think also uh, because of uh, of of uh, the politics of it all, I really think that they want the door to be as open as possible. They don't want to create any internal controversy. Um, you know, the group, they really feel that the groups, uh, they really report to the groups. So, because of the the upside-down triangle structure. So, you know, uh, maybe they just don't want to uh, take a stand on it. Um, I, think, I think it's worth taking a stand on. I think if we lose the 12th step as the message that we're supposed to carry, we're going to become more and more ineffective, and there's going to be more and more people drinking on us after we work with them. Yeah. You know what I mean? I agree, yeah. Perhaps you are not acquainted with any drinkers who want to recover. You can easily find some by asking a few doctors, ministers, priests, or hospitals. Remember, you're looking for the ones who want to recover. They will be only too glad to assist you. Don't start out as an evangelist or reformer. Unfortunately, a lot of prejudice exists. You'll be handicapped if you arouse it. Ministers and doctors are competent, and you can learn much from them if you wish. But it happens that because of your own drinking experience, you can be uniquely useful to other alcoholics. So cooperate, never criticize. To be helpful is our only aim. Um, You know, Bill, is uh, this chapter, I think, reflects a lot of the stuff that was going on uh, in Akron at that time. Um, I think that um, the Akron's ties to, uh, to religion and to Christianity was incredibly strong. I think the ties in New York were much, much looser. Right. And he was always trying to find a middle ground between New York and Akron. It's an, it's an, over, uh, you know, it's an oversimplification to say New York was filled with atheists and Akron was filled with evangelists. Uh-huh. <laughs> but, but there is some truth to, to that. that. Yeah. There is some truth to that. It still is, isn't there? There, there really is. And, yeah. and, and Akron was a whole heck of a lot more effective at keeping people sober than New York, New York was. <laughs> and, and still is. I'll tell you, if I was going to land in one of those two cities and have to go uh, to meetings to, to stay sober, uh, I would rather land in Akron than, than New York any time, let me tell you. <laughs> but uh, but I, think he was, I think he was trying to curb people's zeal a little bit about the uh, the religious uh, or or god uh, uh god angle uh christian angle uh let's see here when you discover a prospect for alcoholics anonymous find out all you can about him now this is kind of uh, important um let's say you get a phone call hey you know my you know our our father is drinking himself to death or my brother's in real trouble or whatever uh it's a good idea to ask a lot of questions this is <laughs> When you approach someone, you want them to be able to identify at the highest level possible. The more identification, the more trust usually there will be. Yeah. The, the, the more that they will, uh, the more that they'll uh, start to become convinced that you can help. So if you know about 
you know, what type of drinking they have, if you know about some of the experiences they've had, you can share similar experiences and, and uh, be able to identify it at a deeper level. If he does not want to stop drinking, don't waste time trying to persuade him. You may spoil a later opportunity. I love, I love this suggestion, too. I, I don't know about you, Monty, but when, when I first got sober, I really was trying to get a lot of people sober who had no real interest in getting sober. <laughs> you know, yeah. I became kind of an evangelist uh, run, running around. Oh, sure. you, you know, it's really great. You should try it. And, <laughs> and again, what you can be doing uh, is you can be spoiling a later opportunity. Yeah. You know, when, when alcohol really does get their attention, they'll remember some knucklehead you know, trying to talk them into something that they didn't want to do or didn't understand or didn't believe in. Yeah. <laughs> Again, uh, we want to find the people who honestly want to stop drinking. Mm-hmm. Um, in the 12-step meetings today, uh, they're flooded with people from rehabs and detoxes, okay? Yeah. That does not mean those individuals want to stop drinking. Just because you're in treatment, that's certainly not an indication that you want to stop tr- uh, drinking. A lot of times it's your family wants you to stop drinking or your boss wants you to stop drinking. Now, wanting to stop drinking for good and for all is not, not something everyone is going to have, but it's basically telling us to look for those individuals. They're going to be easier to work with. They're going to, it's, they're going to be more willing to go through the 12 step process. If you find somebody that just wants to stay sober, but, oh, my God, those steps, not for me, you know, that's, that's crazy. We're not supposed to work with them. Mm. If, if, they're not, if they're not really serious about stopping and willing uh, to follow the 12th step and to take the 12th step, we're really not supposed to work with them. And, uh, you know, a majority of the people that show up as newcomers uh, are are in the other camp. They're not. They're not. They don't want to go through the steps, and they, and they probably won't. Those are people that we're not supposed to spend our time with. It doesn't mean that we can't be friendly and we can't be helpful. Mm-hmm. We're just not supposed to waste a lot of time with them because there are to, there are the the time that we spend can be uh, better used with someone who who knows they're in real trouble and really wants a solution. Those are the people we can really help. Do you think? Uh, do you think, Chris? I mean, I don't know what it is out there, but here there seems to be a lack of. I'm not going to say a lack of people that aren't qualified to be a sponsor, but there seems to be a lack of of people sponsoring, and the ones that are sponsoring are taking on way too many people because of that. You know, again, it's it's a it's a watered down uh, it's a watered down fellowship. You end up with so many people in the fellowship who really aren't alcoholic. They're not. They're, they haven't lost uh, power, choice, and control uh, to the point where they would need a spiritual awakening to, right. be able to recover, uh, because they wouldn't be sitting in the meeting sober week after week after week if they were alcoholic. You know, so you, so you get a you get a huge watering down uh, over time of people who really were alcohol abusers. Um, not alcohol dependent, who show up in the meetings, and and what happen what happens is is when you go through these steps, you want to sponsor. There was a period of time where I had uh, you know I had over fifty people that Gee I was working with. Okay, fifty people, <laughs> and you know I don't do that anymore. You know, there's there's people there's people that I, I pass people off to who I think will work well together. But uh, you know I was I was really the only guy in the area that that had experience. With, with these steps that could help the people who were in real trouble. And I had to step up and I had to do it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if you have an area that's like that, you got to step up and, you, you know, you got to do it. Uh, but, but hopefully what happens is the people that you sponsor become experienced. And now, now you're building up uh, a fellowship about you of experienced people who can, who can now, you know, uh, shoulder some of the burden. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's, that's really kind of the kind of the, the way it is. Here's the thing: there's two things you can do, Monty. You can carry somebody to the message, or you can carry the message to them. To carry somebody to the message, all you need to do is you know get them, you know, bring them to a meeting, you know, tell them to keep coming back. Well, although you can you can hit them with all the happy little slogans, you know that that's really that's really encouraging somebody to go to the message. 
and mm-hmm. the message is inherent in, in this book and, and in the 12 steps. But if you want to carry the message to the alcoholic, which is what they're telling us to do, you have to have the message to carry. And there's very few people I know who really, really, and actually went through the steps that don't work with other people. It, it, just, it just doesn't happen. Be- because there's, a, there's an inner drive to carry this message once you've had a spiritual awakening. Sure. You know, if somebody just never, ever sponsors, never wants to, uh, I, I question that they've had a spiritual awakening uh, as, as the result of the 12 step, because that's just not, not how you end up at the end of the step. You, you, would automatically, you would automatically have a desire. I mean, I think it's just natural, built in it to us when uh, there's a, a malady and then uh, there is recovery from that to want to share that with other people that are hurting. Absolutely. I mean, you're, you've just been placed on a completely new footing on life. Things are, things are becoming really wonderful for you in a number of different ways, especially the internal uh, wonderful ways, you mm-hmm. know, emotionally, spiritually, mentally. And you're just, you know, you, you want to you be of help. And you also, you will recognize that by being of help, you're, you're uh, you know, you're, Helping yourself. Uh, you're ensuring your immunity, and you're helping your own spiritual condition. Sure, you know. So, so the people that um, uh, I, I I question the people that just sit, sit in sit in the fellowship meetings and just don't do anything. Just show up once a week to, you know, grumble a little bit, put a dollar in the basket, and have a bad cup of coffee. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I really I really question, you know, uh, what is going on uh, with, with with that. What is that? You know. I, I, that's not that hasn't been my experience. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, before uh, before I had gotten through the steps, uh, I, I was one of those people, uh, but I wasn't going to last very long as one of those people. I was going to end up drinking again, killing myself, or going insane, because that's what happens to alcoholics without without some transformational spiritual experience. Yeah. But anyway, this advice is given her for his uh, for his family too. They should be patient realizing they are dealing with a sick person. Um, a lot of times families will really push up on somebody. And what this book is basically saying is that may not be the best strategy. It says wait for them to go on a bender. You know, wait for them to hit bottom again. Wait for them to come out of one more blackout with one more summons in their pocket for a DUI. You know, you know, and, and then they may be more receptive to talking to somebody like you, they're, they're not supposed to plead hysterically mm-hmm. with you. I, I, that's that's really, you know, uh, uh, what, what is it? What does it say early in the book? Frothy emotional, emotional appeal, appeal seldom suffices. Yeah, and and it, it certainly didn't suffice with me. But if there is any indication that he wants to stop, have a good talk with the person most interested in him, usually his wife. Get an idea of his behavior, his problems, his background the seriousness of his condition, and his religious leanings. Remember, you're numbering, you're numbering these, Monty. Uh, you need this information to put yourself in his place to see how you would like him to approach you if the tables were turned. Mm-hmm. This is doing your due diligence before a sales call. Let's say you're a big corporate salesman and you're about to go sell to XYZ Corporation. You want to know as much as you can about X, Y, and Z Corporation to be able to handle the sales call. Well, it's the same thing with us. We are, we're discovering a prospect. We're going to them. We're trying to identify. And to do that, we need to know as much as we can about them. And then, then, we, set, then, we, then we put the bait on the hook. And the bait on the hook basically is, you know, I'm recovered. My, you know, my wife is, my life is wonderful now. There are so many great things that are going on. And then they're going to, they're going to be curious and maybe interested. So it's, it is kind of a, an approach, the same type of approach as you do, would do with a sales call. Sometimes it is wise to wait until he goes on a binge. The family may object to this, but unless he is in a dangerous physical condition, it is better to risk it. All right, when somebody has gone on a bench and comes, comes out of that bench pitifully and incomprehensibly demoralized, it's a wonderful time to say, well, you know, are you done yet? Are you done yet? You want help now? You know, it's just a good time. That, they're, they're softened up a little bit 
by alcohol. Alcohol is the great persuader, by the way. You know, we don't need to persuade anybody, really. <laughs> alcohol, alcohol is the great persuader. Let me ask you. you let know, me ask you a question here, Chris. Sure. Uh, I want to go back to the. Um, if there is any indication that he wants to stop, have a good talk with the person most interested in him, usually his wife. <clears throat> it's interesting how we many times tell, like I, I, I've been to sponsor workshops where they're they're uh, they're teaching you how to sponsor and so forth. And one of the things that I've heard on a regular uh, uh, on a regular basis is everything that you talk about with your sponsee stays with you and your sponsee. And you should never discuss your sponsee with other family members. And I, under, I understand part of that, but, but here it's suggesting that you talk to, uh, in this case, his wife. Um, wh what do you think about that? I mean, that's, that's probably well, not always wise, is it? You know, let, let's, put this, let's put this in context. You haven't even met the individual yet. Yeah. You know, this instruction is basically find out all you can about him before you approach him. Now, I, I, I know basically what you're talking about. I've been dragged into, you know, uh, family squabbles and, you know, should I divorce them? And I've been dragged into all that, and I've had my own challenges with it. Um, the book basically says we do not share any part of anyone's story unless we are sure they would approve. Right. So, so if if someone shares a bunch of stuff with you, you do not share that with anybody else unless you are sure they would approve. So uh, uh, also, also, you know, certainly fifth step stuff is unbelievably confidential. But I like, I like to keep, uh, I like to keep anything that could even possibly be looked on in a negative way uh, to myself. Okay. Uh, between the people that I'm, I'm working with, now we don't live in a bubble. You know, hey, how's Joe doing? You know, uh, you, you know, oh, he's doing okay, or well, he's kind of having a hard time. You know. I'll do I'll do that if uh, if there's you know if there's a real reason for it, but getting into specifics um, that could be damaging to an individual, I won't do it. And also, I'm going to lose all credibility with an individual if I tell his wife everything that's going on between us. You know, if he's coming over to my house and we're going through the steps and I'm finding out some stuff about him and his wife is asking me all these questions or the family is asking me all these questions. I'm gonna I'm gonna lose uh, I'm gonna lose that connection I'm gonna lose the sure. the confidence that the individual is placing in me, you know some of this stuff is sacred, some of this stuff is confidential, and you know some of this stuff can be shared if we're sure they would approve. We we, we just have to use tact and yeah. common sense. Yeah. You know when, when we're when we're doing this, and I'll tell you what, the best way to learn how to do it is to do it. <laughs> you know I made a lot of mistakes uh, uh, working with people and. Uh, you know, sometimes you learn from your mistakes. Mistakes aren't always bad. A lot of times, uh, they 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 make you feel uh, uncomfortable enough that you're going to pay attention uh, in a more uh, strenuous way the next time and and become a little bit better at it. What I'm noticing here is I don't want to jump ahead on you, but where it says don't deal with him when he is very drunk, unless he is ugly and the family needs your help. And I think what it's saying there is like if he's getting physical, and uh, yeah, if there's yeah. you know if there's a confrontation, a commotion, uh, you know that would happen back in the early days. Sure, drunks would get violent. There was a, there was some someone that chased Lois Wilson around the, their apartment with a pair of scissors. I mean, you know, it, it, it even says that we may need we may need to fight with these alcoholics. Mm -hmm. But, but the, working with the family, re remember the first person we approach is the wife. Of the person, yeah. yeah. But we, we're trying to engage the family uh, in this recovery process, and I've found that where there's a cooperative family, mm -hmm. the the outcomes are much higher for the alcoholic. How many sponsors would you say that you know of that that really know the sponsee's family? You know, um, it's probably unfortunately fairly low these days. Yeah. Uh, but but when you know when I'm working with a brand new guy, uh, I'd say it's at least fifty fifty that I that, that I've talked with the family. Uh huh. Uh, at least in the early stages. Now there may not be as much reason uh, to engage the family after the person starts to starts to get their one year coins. You know, 
to your coin. Uh, things things have calmed down. You've got them through the steps. And it may just be a social or friendly uh, type of communication. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, these are... These were these were low bottom alcoholics. They were ten. You know, you, you drink like they did. You could become violent, and uh, and there's a, there's a lot of times if you get a call from a family saying, "Oh my God, he's going crazy," could you please help? Grab a couple of the boys and go help. You know, mm-hmm. that's what it's basically telling you to do. I mean, I've had my life threatened twice on uh, on twelve step calls, and um, uh, two times, you know, somebody uh, somebody threatened me. I mean, they didn't. I wasn't hurt. But it got a little bit, uh, a little bit scary. I always had somebody with me, and yeah. I really would not go on any type of twelve-step call where there's even a hint of possible violence without uh, overwhelming numbers. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, there have been people that have been killed on on twelve-step calls when they've gone there by themselves or, you know, they get there and the guy's cleaning his gun, you know, in a blackout. <laughs> I mean, you know, we, we don't do this stuff to get killed. Yeah. <laughs> we need we need to be rational and reasonable about it. But, you know, if, if a drunk is, uh, you know, uh, ripping the pictures off the wall and throwing the furniture around and you've, you've developed a, a relationship with the family, you know, get some of the boys and go over there. If you have to call the police, call the police. You know, uh, mm-hmm. do do whatever you need to do to ensure the family's safety, and then and and then you know, then then <laughs> visit uh, visit the drunk when they get released from uh, custody. Good, yeah. Don't deal with him when he's very drunk or ugly unless his family needs your help. Wait for the end of the spree, or at least for a lucid interval. <clears throat> then let his family or friend ask if he wants to quit for good, and if he would go to any extreme to do so. Now. This is not what happens a lot of times in uh, in the recovery meetings today. We quit. We quit thinking one day at a time. If if somebody told me I was going to have to quit for good when I first walked in, I'd have walked right out the door. You know? <laughs> I mean, you, you, you hear all this all this all this uh, hobble gobble. Uh, we're not supposed to work with somebody unless they're willing to quit for good and for all, and they're willing to go to any extreme to do so. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a qualifier. Oh, you're, you, you know, you're not. What, what I like to do is, it says in this chapter, leave the book with them on the first visit. Let them read the book. Now, when you ask them, are they willing to go to any lengths? They're going to know what any lengths looks like. Like if you just came up to me and you said, uh, Chris, are you willing to go to any lengths? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's not like I'm, I'm considering that. I don't even know what you're talking about. I'm just saying yes to. Because that's what I think you want me to say. What I what I like to do is I like to I like people to understand what any extreme or any link actually means, and hopefully you can do that on your first or second visit with an alcoholic prospect. If he says yes, then his attention should be drawn to you as a person who has recovered. You should be described to him as one of a fellowship who, as part of their own recovery, try to help others. And, and who will be glad to talk to him if he cares to see you. If he does not want to see you, never force yourself upon him. Neither should the family hysterically plead with him to do anything, nor should they tell him much about you. They should wait for the end of his next drinking bout. You might place this book where he can see it in the interval. Here, no specific rule can be given. The family must decide these things, but urge them not to be overanxious, for that might spoil matters. Hmm. Usually the family should not try to tell your story. Whenever possible, avoid meeting a man through his family. Approach through a doctor or an institution is a better bet. If your man needs hospitalization, he should have it, but not forcibly unless he is violent. Let the doctor, if he will, tell him he has something in the way of a solution. Now, these are all these are all things that you know uh, manipulation techniques actually that uh, that you can use uh, when when you're when you're doing these twelve step calls. Mm-hmm. When your man is better, you know, uh, um, after they stop, you know, shaking from the DTs, the doctor might suggest a visit from you. Though you have talked with the family, leave them out of the first discussion. Under these conditions, your prospect will see he is under no pressure. He will feel he can deal with you without being nagged by his family. Call on him when he is still jittery. He may be more receptive when depressed. You know, I'll tell you one experience I had. This uh, The family called me up 
This guy had been drinking for weeks, and when I got there, he was near incoherent. Okay, but he, but he, I could tell, and he, he, he vocalized the fact that he did want help. He would not go to a hospital. He would not uh, go to a detox, um, uh, and. And so we we brought him over to our house and we stuck him on the couch and he shook it off. Now I'm not I'm not recommending that. You should, there's some good detoxes out there and and good hospitals and good rehabs and you probably should be on uh, Librium or, or or Ativan or something like that for a serious detox. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, but in this case it just wasn't possible. So we brought him over to the house to shake it off. He did not leave uh, the room I had him in for three days, and he was he was really sick, and he and he was getting better. And during that time, when he was sick, I got him up to the ninth step. And when he left that room after three days, uh, just like Doctor Bob's story, he was off making amends. That individual is still around and still sober today, and it's been about thirteen years. Mm. And he was a real low bottom alcoholic. You know, so I believe in what they tell us to do in this book. I don't believe some of the half measures out there. I, I don't believe in watching for your triggers. I, you know, I don't believe in that stuff. I believe in the fundamental psychic change that can be made possible by going through these steps. And that's what they're talking about in this chapter. See your man alone if possible. That does not mean go on the 12-step call alone if there's any chance that it can get out of control. Right. But see, the man alone means don't sit there with his family and do this 12-step call while his wife and his children are, are in the same room. Yeah. <laughs> At first, engage in general conversation. After a while, turn the talk to some phase of drinking. Tell him enough about your drinking habits, symptoms, and, and experiences to encourage him to speak of himself. If he wishes to talk, let him do so. You will thus get a better idea of how you want to proceed. If he is not communicative, give him a sketch of your drinking career up to the time you quit. But say nothing for the moment of how that was accomplished. If he's in a serious mood, dwell on the troubles liquor has caused you, being careful not to moralize or lecture. If his mood is light, tell him humorous stories of your escapades. Get him to tell some of his. When he sees you know all about the drinking game, commence to describe yourself as an alcoholic. Tell him how baffled you were about how you couldn't separate, how you finally learned that you were sick. Give him an account of the struggles you made to stop. Show him the mental twist which leads to the first drink of a spray, the strange strange mental blank spot. We suggest you do this as we have done in the chapter on alcoholism. If he is an alcoholic, he will understand you at once. He will match your mental inconsistencies with some of his own. If you are satisfied that he is a real alcoholic, begin to dwell on the hopeless feature of the malady. Remember, you know, this is a self-diagnosed illness. I'm not, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not saying that it isn't. But if you're working with somebody, Monty, it's telling you to be sure he is a real alcoholic. You know, uh, see if he fits the description. Okay. Show him from your own experience how the queer mental condition surrounding that first drink prevents normal functioning of the willpower. Don't at this stage refer to this book unless he has seen it and wishes to discuss it. And be careful not to brand him as an alcoholic. Let him draw his own conclusion. If he sticks to the idea that he can still control his drinking, tell him that possibly he can if he's not too alcoholic. But insist that if he is severely afflicted, there may be little chance he can recover by himself. Uh... That's very, very interesting, uh, interesting <laughs> approach toward dealing with an alcoholic. Now, I've tried it my way, and I've tried it this way. And I've got to tell you, this way, this way <laughs> cuts out a lot of nonsense. It cuts out working with the people who really aren't alcoholic, who are just going to screw you around. Mm-hmm. It, it, it cuts out wasting time with somebody that really doesn't want to stop drinking. It makes it so you are not wasting your time, and you can move on to the next prospect, the next person who has a really good chance of getting through the steps and recovering from alcoholism. I'm still numbering all these. There's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> How many so far? Uh, 25 specific uh, directions to, uh, to follow. 
25 directions, and it's, what, two and a half pages? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, I knew it. I knew it. Yeah. You know, when when, uh, when I was uh, when I was drinking Monty, unfortunately, <clears throat> my personal experience was there wasn't anybody who really cared enough or understood enough, I should rather say, what was going on with me to make a difference in my life. I probably could have been intervened on. I probably uh, could have uh, cut years and years off of off of my drinking had somebody approached me with a real answer. But really, you know, what was happening and what was happening in my life is, you know, my my family was really just expecting me to die, and they were just waiting for me to die. They really didn't think that there was anything that was going to stop that from happening. Mm -hmm. And they were just trying to stay as uninvolved uh, as possible in my life. You know, um, there are a lot of people that die of alcoholism out there that don't have to. If there were informed sponsors or if there were informed professionals who really understood alcoholism and understood what approaches uh, make the most sense and have the best outcomes, I think there's a lot more of us that would survive than than are surviving now. What do you? What do you? What is your? Uh, I don't want to get sidetracked here, but what is your opinion about people sponsoring when they're very early in recovery? I believe this, and this this is probably very controversial. I believe that if you've gotten to the steps, you can show someone else how you went through the steps, and you can do that at a week. However, there are people with 20 years that really shouldn't be sponsoring, uh, shouldn't be sponsoring yeah. because what they're doing is they're just encouraging you not to drink. They're not offering you recovery from alcoholism. Mm -hmm. They're merely encouraging you not to drink. Just keep going, keep going to meetings, boy. You know, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's simple encouragement, and that doesn't really work right. uh, all the time for a real alcoholic. But they need, they definitely need to have gone through these steps. I believe so. I yeah. Mean, how do you carry this message to another alcoholic if you if you haven't experienced this message? Right. You know, I don't, and I don't think you can have a spiritual awakening as a result of steps you haven't taken <laughs> any more than you can come back from a place you've never been. Yeah. Um, uh, you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It doesn't make a lot of sense. So uh, I'm I'm hardcore about this. I, I you know. You can encourage somebody to want to stay sober, but our book tells us no amount of willpower can keep us from picking up the first drink. Right. So if all we're doing is encouraging somebody not to drink, and yet no amount of willpower will keep them from from drinking, what, what are you really doing? Yeah. So uh, I believe in offering somebody uh, the recovery solution, the, the, the steps we have taken, mm -hmm. you know, and help them to take those steps. Not everybody's going to get through the steps. A lot of people get somewhere into the steps and say, you know, this is a this is an overreaction to a problem. I really think I have under control. And nine times out of ten, they'll drink again. And you know, sometimes they'll come back and say, okay, okay, this has happened to me many times. Okay, okay, I'll do it all. You know, I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Alcohol is the great persuader. Yeah. <laughs> Where are we at here? So. Um, you know, when I think about uh, this chapter, I think about the experience these alcoholics had. Here's what here's what they would do, Monty. Monday night, you know, they would get together at somebody's house and talk about, okay, where are we going to go find prospects this week? And sometimes they'd break up in teams. Sometimes they'd go on their own. And Tuesday, they'd go out to the hospitals. They'd go out to the sanitariums. They'd go down to the Bowery. They'd go to the missions. Wednesday, same thing, looking for prospects. Thursday, same thing, looking for prospects. Friday, same thing. Finally, some of them have started to find prospects. What they would do is they would put them in the hospital, either Towns or St. Mary's or whatever in Akron. Yeah. And and uh, they'd get the person, uh, you know, are you willing? Yes, I'm willing. Okay, you're going to you're going to stay a couple of days in the hospital. And then once they were in the hospital, they'd get all the boys together and they'd start sending them in one at a time to tell their story and to do their 12-step bit, you know, to identify and talk about their recovery. And by the time those people got out of the hospital, they were ready to start working the steps, the steps that they hadn't worked in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Now, that was how the week was laid out for these people prior to the writing of the book. 
for one reason or another, we all think we should do 90s and 90s. We should all go to a meeting every night. That's not what this book tells us to do. This book tells us to get out there and find prospects. Mm. Find prospects for Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, to uh, Start to build up the fellowship you crave. There are alcoholics dying by the wayside, it says, who need our help. So, you know, I think hiding out in in meetings doing 90s and 90s, I don't know where that came from. That You know, that certainly didn't come from the text Alcoholics Anonymous. I have a feeling that, you know, uh, misguided treatment uh, protocols came up with that one, yeah. you know, uh, because they didn't even have 90 meetings uh, back, back then. <laughs> yeah. You know, so... So there's a lot of things that have that have uh, that have taken place in the fellowships today that are easier, softer ways that are more politically, uh, you know, warm and fuzzy, uh, but they pull us away from our primary purpose, which is to carry, stay sober, and carry the message. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, one of the one of the things that you know I'm grateful for is that we're going over this chapter and we're going over it in detail, and every one of us falls short. As far you're gonna you're gonna come up with 150 or so directions when we're done with this chapter, maybe more, Monty. Mm-hmm. And every single one of us falls short every single day following those directions. But I'll tell you, if we can just all get a little bit better at doing what it says in this chapter, fewer people are gonna die. Yeah, yeah, amen. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because uh, there are too many. Uh, there are way too many people dying in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, etc. Um, because they're being being taught what a non-alcoholic, I mean, just what a non-alcoholic would need and no further than that. Yeah, the yeah. heavy drinker suggestions. Uh, you know, yeah. li- living sober instead of recovering from alcoholism. There you go. You know, those are two completely, completely different things. I'm all for all those wisdom sayings and all for those, you know, it's real sober guidance and, and it works real well. But again, that in itself is insufficient uh, uh, for a defense against alcohol. If you're really alcoholic, it may it may help people who haven't gone down the scale uh, too far to really to talk about their feelings mm-hmm. uh, every night at the closed-minded discussion meeting. <laughs> that really may be a good thing for them, you know. But what's going to happen is is uh, is the low bottom alcoholics going to show up in that meeting, and they ain't going to make it. They're going to look around and say, "These people are crazy. Uh, this, I, what is going on here? There's going to be no identification, you know, and and they're going to stop going to the meetings because they're going to know there's no answer there, right? And you know, sometimes there's they're right. You know, <laughs> if they didn't read how it works, you wouldn't even know it was a it was a recovery meeting. So, uh, so again, we we really we, you know primary purpose, primary purpose, primary purpose. Stay sober, absolutely, uh, but to carry this message, yeah, to other alcoholics, the message of the steps. You know, the whole Renaissance, the whole. Uh, 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 the whole twelve-step or big book renaissance that's going on right now is about that. It's about getting back to these basics, about back to the things that work. Because there's a lot of new things now that don't work. And uh, uh, you look at the you look at the rates of, uh, of of recovery in some of the some of the meetings today. You're going to see that it's a revolving door. There may be a core group of people who are there year after year after year, mm-hmm. but the rest of it is revolving door. Mm-hmm. And you know this is. This this renaissance uh, of getting back to the text of Alcoholics Anonymous is really based on we need to change that we need mm-hmm. to change that or or you know uh, or we're irresponsible we're letting we're letting people die we're we're con- you know it's contributory manslaughter is yeah. basically what it is if if we're not stepping up to the plate hey uh, uh, when when I see. Uh... When I see people uh, getting ready to put a new meeting together, I'm going to suggest they call it the closed-minded discussion meeting. (laughs) I like that. (laughs) Some of them are. Yeah. You know what I mean. You bet. Um, Let's see. We're almost out of time. Where would you like to leave us off with this week? You know, let's let's look at at, uh, when we all get – to the end of our journey here on this planet. Will we have left it a better place 
you know, that have, will we have given more than we have taken? Mm. Now, the alcoholic being, you know, building their whole method of operation from a selfish, self-centered, self-seeking platform is more than likely to get to the end of the lifespan, and he's taken more than he is given. Yeah, I think we're offered an opportunity here, Monty, a wonderful opportunity to set right the scales. I mean, didn't you didn't you feel guilty and remorseful over you know your your twenty years or so of uh, of partying like partying like a maniac and letting everybody down? I mean, you know, we 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 did. We felt we felt guilt and we felt yeah. remorse. Now we're being oper- we're, we're being offered a chance, offered a blueprint, basically, uh, to get busy setting the scale right. You know, I've had I've had the unbelievable joy of helping a whole lot of people in my life. And if if I would have died in 1989, there would have been three people at my funeral, and you know uh, they wouldn't have been able to move the casket, uh, you know, out of the hearse because <laughs> there was only three people. You know, uh, that would have been uh, the extent of my my funeral. Uh, uh, I don't think it would look that way today. No, and Chris, Chris, I think that there's been enough work done on my part that there's enough people that are convinced that uh, I'm, I'm a worthy contributor to to the human uh, uh, human condition here on earth and i've done some things to set right the scales and a lot of that has to do with working with others yeah so it's an experience nobody should miss so nobody so, should miss and, and i gotta i gotta say just as you know we have this i think we have this thing and i understand i understand the heart behind this but i think it gets twisted this whole idea that somehow we should be um you know, setting ourselves in, in, in our place, making sure that the more we learn, the less we know. We need to stay humble and we can't take any credit for what we've done and all this stuff. And I understand the heart behind that. But you know what? The things that we did, that that by doing those, we felt guilty and remorseful and, and the whole nine yards. Well, when we're doing things that are right, is there is there anything wrong with feeling good and saying, you know what? I did that right. Absolutely not. You know, my favorite my favorite uh, definition of humility is an accurate self appraisal. Hmm. So if you're doing really well and that's an accurate appraisal, fine. Now we don't want to we don't want to become pompous and you know braggarts or right. you know power driven maniacs. You know, that's that's certainly a, a, a negative negative uh, negative character trait, but. You know, I'm not going to sit there, you know, being Mr. Mr. Humble, Mr. Uh, you know, uh, 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 Mr. Doormat for anybody. You know, that's that's not why we uh, why we get sober. We're not we're not defective uh, uh, spiritual people. We're ill people. Yeah. And uh, part of the illness uh, was had to do with the spirit and the morality of the individual. But that ain't the way it is today, you know, um, uh, not, in, not in my life. And, yeah. you know, if God is really the one who's in charge of removing the character defects and we really did all the work to participate, and you still have a little bit of an ego or a little bit of a, of a drive, kind of like Bill Wilson had, I don't necessarily see that that's a bad thing. Um, you know, I, I think it's I think it's a good thing. Yeah, uh, to, I do too. To have healthy self esteem. Sure, sure. And you know, I you know, I I always always remind myself to give to give all the credit and glory to 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 my creator. But you know, at the same time, I, well, I, I complimented a guy uh, uh, at a speaker meeting one time. I said I really appreciate what you said, particularly in this area and this area. And he said, well, you know, nothing I did was me. It was all God and all that stuff, you know, and I understand that. But I told him, I said, you know, I could have sworn I seen your lips moving. <laughs> you know, I, I, I mean, really, I think it's okay to say, you know what? I, I did a good job today. I'm not, I'm not drinking. I'm sober. I was able to carry the message. You know, thank you, God, for allowing me to serve you. I think if we don't feel good about ourselves, yeah. uh, I think we've missed something in the recovery process. Yeah, I think you're right. Because it's those negative, uh, those negative emotions that the whole 12-step process is designed to eliminate. You know, mm-hmm. it's not not eliminate, but certainly marginalize. Yeah. Um, you know, I was so I I thought so little of myself when I first came in, and 
I, I think a lot of myself right now. I mean, but I, but I'm hoping it's like in balance and it's not annoying. You know, it's not to the to the yeah. that it's annoying <laughs> to other people. And people have told me it's not. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but we're, we're this is about recovery. This is about being healthy. This is about. Uh, being reborn. This is about being the spearhead of God's ever advancing creation. You know. Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? It's about <laughs> it's about some wonderful, wonderful things. If you know, it, you know, so many people sit around like with scowls on their faces. I, I, I sometimes I feel like saying, you know, if you're in recovery, why don't you tell your face? You know. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. This is about the joy of living is the 12th step. It says that in the step book. 12th step is about the joy of living. Mm. And if there's not joy in your life, you are doing it wrong. Right. Now, there may be circumstances in your life that are really challenging, but you can still have a joy about life Mm -hmm. no matter how challenging they are. You can lay your head down on your pillow at night and and receive what I believe God is saying to you, well done, good and faithful servant. You did it. You had a good day. Uh, you know, absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. and if you're anything like me, you you invite God in first thing you do in the morning upon awakening. Yeah. You know, you 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 ask God to to direct and and uh, and uh, direct your thinking, mold your ideals, uh, empower you to you know uh, do His will. And if you do that, if you do that, you know, <laughs> there's some good things that are going to happen. And you're on his team. And, you know, if you're not, you know, if, if you're on his team, what do you got to worry about? That's right. If God is for you, who can be against you? Yeah, what do you got to worry yeah, about? Yeah, I hear you. Well, Chris, uh, we are out of time, and we're going to be uh, coming back next week with more of uh, the 12th step and working with others. And uh, I pray that you have a fabulous week, my friend. Thank you so much, Monty. We'll see you back here next week. All right, folks. Don't forget to come back each and every week as, once again, Chris Schroeder and I, and more Chris than I, really, help us all to walk through the big book. This has been a broadcast of KHLT Recovery Broadcasting. (laughs) 